Millions of frontline workers keep our economy running and are provided with the latest technology to do their jobs. But digital adoption, especially by frontline workers, is really hard. This is Frontline Innovators. We explore how to overcome challenges and achieve success when we empower our essential workers. I'm Justin Lake. And I'm Gene Signorini. Together, we speak with experts who are leading the way and driving digital transformation to the front line. This podcast is sponsored by Skillful on a mission to help frontline workers learn and use the technology needed to succeed in their jobs. Welcome to the Frontline Innovators Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Lake, and I'm super excited about today's episode. Today's guest is the Organizational Change Management Senior Manager at Unisys. Please welcome to the show, Corey Cheng. Hello, Corey. Hi, how are you, Justin? I'm very well and really looking forward to this. We've been preparing for today for several weeks and uh, can't wait to get started with you and introduce you to our audience. As we're doing that, I'd like to ask you the question that we start every episode of Frontline Innovators with, which is what do you think is the biggest challenge facing the deskless or frontline workforce today? Good question. I am really excited to be here. I think that's a, a an important question. It's actually um, the biggest challenge, I think, is something that all workers face, but especially frontline deskless workers, uh, is really communication and connecting to the organizational objectives, what the, um, the project or the initiative outcomes are going to be, and how that translates down to their actual work and how it impacts and how to connect the dots in their particular uh, behavior and, and the changes that uh, flow out to them. And it is key because they're usually front client facing, right? So they have a particular lens and to hear something up on high and have it translate down, it can get muddled sometimes. Uh, they don't have access to the typical channels that organizations push out, which is email, intranet, um, so it's harder. They, they have a harder time. I think that's a, a really good point. And one of the things that you said that really stuck out to me is the fact that many of the frontline folks, by definition, are client facing, right? Mm -hmm. and so it's the, the most important aspect of the organization. And yet oftentimes they are disconnected from some of the most important information inside the organization. Why do you think this is, not just in the organizations that you've been a part of, but do, do you have a, a take on why this problem continues to persist with frontline workforces? I think it's just a matter of um, scale, right? As pe pe the corporate communications are trying to push out information, you have to do it on a large scale. And so you do the easiest channels, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not saying that because we're trying to be lazy. It's just efficiency, right? And uh, so you do it from a consistent standpoint and you push it out across. But then it's important to also layer it and make sure it's, it's nuanced down to the front line. And because they're not at the desk, that's a harder task right? It, it's a way you have to figure out another, almost another avenue. So I don't think many organizations have really mastered how to do that well. It's just, you know, it's not a cookie cutter kind of thing. Yeah, I think you're right. And and I think it's something, uh, an interesting word that you use there, you said layered. I, I'd be curious to, I, I think I know what you mean on that, but I'd, I'd like to to hear you describe what you mean by layered in that regard. Mm -hmm. communication is is important we all know that's key right and people hear things and especially around change you need to continue to hear it and continue to hear it because it hits you in different ways right so it's like you got to hear it in surround sound you have to hear it from up above coming from the corporate you have to hear it from your peers you have to hear it from your your immediate boss and, and have this sort of many layered approach to hearing the messages. Um, and, and I don't just mean different medias, right? Not, not just, um, you know, email, display board, uh, in your team huddles, 
that too, but as well as you hear it all around you, right? You get an opportunity to ask questions, um, understand the message and what the impact really is. So that's, does that answer your question about layered? It, it really does. And and I love that. This is going to definitely be one of the quotes of this episode is that you have to hear it in surround sound. That that was perfect for me. It, it gave me a, a great way to visualize kind of what you're describing. But then as, as you went on to explain, it's not just any one of these things or just kind of multiplying the different forms of media, but ensuring that the, the message is, is being heard consistently from all of the sources through which we get our communications. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That makes a lot of uh, sense. And and change is messy. It's inherently messy, right? As you're going forward and as you're implementing it down, you're wanting to evolve it and listen to feedback and make changes as you go. So the message has to come be constant and consistent so that you can stay the course, right? Or yeah. or if it's changing, to be communicating that, right? Right. All right. I have a few things that I want to dig in a little bit deeper on, but before we go into that, I'd like to introduce you to our audience and, and let them get a sense for who they're hearing from. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how you ended up at Unisys and how you ended up in the role that you're in today. Sure, sure. Uh, I've always been in learning and development and training and development uh, and, and born and raised here in the islands, uh, Wine Islands. Uh, but I started my career out in Arizona in um, training and development for a tech company, interestingly, way back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then decided to come move back to the islands um, and got into healthcare. It was a long time in healthcare. Uh, and then um, moved to um, a smaller consulting firm and then on to uh, banking and then to Unisys. In the last 10 years or so, not so much um, in um, training and development. I mean, that was that's where my love is. Um, but as I was um, providing sessions and leadership coaching, uh, more and more leaders would want um, assistance in how to implement the changes, right? So it became more specific around strategic initiatives. How do I help my teams move forward in this and really try to cascade that down? So it became much more focused. And I think in the last, I mean, technology itself is driving the increase in change. So that just became specific for me to just in the last 10 years become very focused in OCM specifically, organizational change management. Yeah. Um, and, and on the last um, several projects I've been on, um, a couple have been on an enterprise resource planning um, projects, which is ERP, um, it's the whole supply chain um, procure, to process, uh, procure to pay process. Um, with the banking one, I was in particular around um, a whole transformation of of the way that we do banking, particularly with uh, now more so with the um, online banking presence, right? That's much more prevalent. So going into a bank was less common. Uh, really, if you go in, you're needing more specific, complex interaction, right? Like taking out a loan or getting mortgage, like that. Um, and uh, then I would say change management is also agnostic, right? It's with any industry, uh, you know, uh, clients I have with Unisys, I've had um, government, um, healthcare as well, uh, retail. So really, we as humans, we all respond to change pretty much the same. So it doesn't matter industry, it doesn't matter the kind of change, really. That's a, an incredible background, and I, I you gave me a, a couple of um, or a couple of thoughts came to mind as you were describing your background. And one thing I want to pull on specifically is the the banking example, how the shift to online banking has changed the experience for those guest services when we do go into a bank. We are going for different things than maybe we did before. And someone recently said to me something I thought was really interesting, and that is that 
through the use of a lot of technology now, we're able to automate a lot of things that were previously manual. So that's the thing that we often all think about when we're thinking about technology implementations. But the other side of that is that those tasks that are left then for the people, for the employees in the organizations tend to be those that require more complex thinking skills and they are just more complex processes period right because if they were a simple process that happened all the time in a very repeatable and predictable fashion we would have used technology to automate them out of the process right so it's really fascinating to really think of it that way and i'm curious do you have any examples that come to mind when you're thinking about that of some of those processes that were kind of left behind as the banking business was transforming to this kind of next era that mm -hmm. only only the people could do and how you manage that change mm -hmm. you would think banking is complex right <laughs> but, but you're right there are some things definitely that became automated um but with the frontline worker, you know, their fear about, am I losing my job, you know, and I really had to take time to address that. Um, so, you know, they do things like now there's, they, they automatically count all the bills, right? They, right? I don't know if you remember, but going in and the teller is counting out her cash, I right? Remember. The bills. Yeah. But now they just put it in the stack and the machine counts it, right? And, it, and then it goes into a little locked safe. Um, so that's something that's automated. Um, ATMs, for example, you know, automated teller machines, they thought that that was going to replace the teller. Right. But we still have ATMs all over, been around for decades, and we still have tellers. So I reassure tellers that, like you said, there's, there's still, um, ways that we interact personally, people have situations that need creative thought process, right? I need to come to you and say, I have this problem. What can you do to help me that an, an ATM is not going to provide? Right. 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 Um, one of the things that uh, as we were going through the bank transformation and I was going around and, um, you know, a particularly passionate person was giving me a lot of grief about that. And, and I find that sometimes the resistance is really because they care so much and they're passionate. So I had to really dig into what he was saying about, you know, um, it's going to be really hard on our kupuna, which is Hawaiian for elders. You know, our elders are going to have a hard time to, they don't even have computers. And I, I got it, right? I understood exactly what he was saying, telling me. Um, and I said, well, think about some, and he was on particularly on an island that was um, rural. So the banks were far apart, you know, mm. access to bank going, actually going into a bank is challenging. Um, and I said, well, think about this. Um, if I know for myself with my mom, um, you know, it's not always easy for her to get in the car and go to the bank. But if I have access with her and I sit down at the computer with her, um, we can do her banking online. And that allows her and me 24-7 access to banking um, transactions, right? And I saw a little light bulb go off and he thought, hey, we can help our, our kupuna do something like that. I, and I said, you know your folks, you just need to get together with their families, have them help, uh, you know, get them set up. And that could be an option. They can still come to the bank. It's not right. excluding that, but it's just another option that technology affords, right? And in fact, it's probably going to make things quite a bit easier in that scenario too, especially in the circumstance where you describe that there's mm -hmm. geographic you know, distribution between all of those facilities, they may be hard to get to the distance traveled may be greater. And so, you know, turning that experience into something that can be flipped around to something positive to actually bridge the gap is, is ultimately going to be more successful. Right. You, know, you said two words in, in this recent description that I think are interesting. You talked about fear and how the employees when faced with change, fear is one of the first emotions. And then the other thing you talked about was the amount that they care. And I think both of those things are things that I've observed 
in the field. I think the fear tends to come through more strongly. They don't necessarily say it explicitly using that term, but you see that behavior where there's a lot of pushback that seems irrational and they come up with a bunch of reasons why the technology is not going to work. And if you really get to know those folks, what you really start to, to learn is that them questioning the technology is really just a way for them to express their fear without saying, I'm scared. I'm curious yes. if that's consistent <laughs> with what you've seen, or if you have other ways to kind of pick up on some of that frustration. I think that is exactly it. You know, um, it's really hard to be vulnerable, right? And say, yeah. I'm afraid. So it gets expressed in a lot of ways. And usually it's about, um, you know, all of the questions. Um, if it starts off as it's not going to work, well, then you've got to dig a little bit more, you know, and, and then you ask them why. But if it's questions around, well, I don't see how this is going to work. Tell me how it's going to work. They're actually a little bit even more accepting than just it's not going to work, right? right. So, so they're kind of, taking it, trying it on for size, um, trying to say, help me mesh and understand how this is going to work. Uh, but some of the fear is around their capability. You know, if they think that their skill gap is going to be so big in this new technology, that's a big fear. And um, I think that's where the supervisor's role is super important because then uh, they really need to understand how to translate what this new technology is going to do for them, you know, make it a safe space for them to try it out and practice, make errors, um, make mistakes and learn and grow. And we all do it together. You know, we're on this road together. And this is what we hope with the outcome. So we may really make that target clear so they know what they're trying to shoot for. Uh, and they don't just feel like... I'm not getting it. This is super hard. Uh, um, I think sometimes too, people don't feel like the automation is going to replace them and they'll lose their jobs. Sometimes that does happen. Mm -hmm. But I think the greater fear is that the automation is going to be so different that they won't have this capability to learn the new job well and that they they'll just opt out and quit or they will, their fear is they'll get fired, right? They won't be able to do the job. That's a really interesting observation that I don't think I've had a lot of other guests point out. And I, I'd like to explore that with you a little bit, uh, a little bit because I, I do think the, the easy answer is to think of automation the way that we might think about it. Those of us that are implementing that technology to the front lines, that the irrational fear, and maybe it's not so irrational, but that the fear is, you know, automating them out of a role. You just described that in a very different way that we may be changing the role to work alongside the technology. So we're saying, hey, it's not here to replace your job, but that doesn't actually eliminate the risk to that individual because in their mind, the risk isn't, well, that's great. I'm still going to have a job but I may not be able to do that job or it's going to be so cumbersome or fearful of actually trying to do it. So, Hey, it, it may almost be better if they would just lay me off, <laughs> you know, right. I'm not, I'm not saying that they would necessarily volunteer for that, but, but it's a really interesting way to think about that problem. How do you think we overcome that scenario in a way that can be effective where we say, Hey, no, it's, you're not going to lose okay. your job and you're not going to be unsuccessful in your new version of this role. How do we handle that? Exactly. Uh, I think that's where, and it, maybe it's just because I'm OCM, right? I think that's where we come in and we say, what are some of the the um, ways that we can provide support? So it's not just training at the end, right? Maybe it's going to be particular job aids that are helpful, um, you know, little um, quick starts that they can start to like, be able to uh, reference and and then I like I mentioned the supervisor really making it safe for them to practice and for them to uh, understand that mistakes are learning mistakes are good yeah um, and giving uh, um, and just because I've been on the ERP projects where um, 
it's such the backbone of a company that they don't replace that often, right? So the technology is super ancient, and then we we change it after so many decades. So people uh, people have a large leap in terms of the learning. The learning curve is super steep. So making that safe and saying, hey, let's make the ramp up really long. Let's do it in chunks. Let's not do flip the switch and you got to know your job. Uh, I think that's helpful if possible. I know that's not always possible, but um, that's where we work with supervisors and say, how can we chunk it out ahead of time? How can we um, give them knowledge so that they understand uh, they might not even be touching the system yet, but if processes are changing, we can talk to them about what, what automation is going to replace, what's going to be shortcut it out, and this is going to be the new process. So they have a high-level understanding, and they're not afraid, and then it's not hitting them all at once at the end. So I, I have a kind of a hot take opinion on this this concept of supervisors being a mechanism for successful change. And that is that we're taking typically the title of supervisor or somebody who may be leading people for their first time. And yet what we're also saying, and this has come up in a lot of conversations that we've had on this podcast and even outside the podcast, that they are critical to the success of the men and women on the front lines to successfully navigate their team members through this change. Yet we're putting the people with the least experience, great potential, but just by definition, the least experience most likely at, in their role as supervisor and now putting them into a role that is essentially mission critical for the navigation of this change. How do we overcome that and and I'm I'm you know I it's a gap and I'm not I'm not pointing the finger at the supervisors because they're new and they've raised their hand to get into a new role and so I'm not I hope I don't come across as if I sound I'm being critical of them in their role but let's just face it by definition they are relatively inexperienced they're not a senior manager with a decade of experience leading people how do we close that gap with these men and women and ensure that they can be successful helping their team be successful. I 100% agree. They are a critical piece and they're closest to the front line. They're the one step above and they, they're, they're the ones that got promoted. Right. And, right. and, and in fact, their challenge is even that they're working, they're a peer that got promoted. Right. So, so that's always challenging. Um, I, I would say that that really is, an organizational onus. It's not on the supervisor, like you said. Right. Um, they're stepping up. And so the organization really needs to provide a lot more. And, and because I come from that training field, right? right? A lot more of the support and, and training background. Uh, so frontline supervision, there's more than just the mechanics of time cards and you know all of that right there's there's more than that there's the real leadership capabilities there's all this change management how to lead in change successfully um i think that it would be wonderful if we were allowed to give or the company allows them time to um and not just taking it online i think that you know now that we've been in the pandemic we've been going more and more towards online training but I think this kind of piece, there's much more of, you need that human interaction. You need to be with other peers, frontline supervisors and talk through, hey, what happens when you when you get this? You know, they wanna know that their problems are shared amongst their peers, that they're not alone, um, that they can kind of reach out and connect. And, you know, that's a big change for them too. So they can get their peer support group is important. Yeah. You know, I, I know when many years ago, when I was a first time supervisor and you're, you described it perfectly, which is you, you come out from being a peer and then you either get 
pulled in or you raise your hand and and you end up in another position that you now have some leadership responsibility over people that yesterday were were your peers. I think one of the things that's often overlooked is how impactful that communication can be because as a supervisor, you are probably friends with some of these people. And so you still are kind of communicating with them as if you're friends and you should still be talking to them as friends, but you also now immediately shift over to being a communicator on behalf of the company. And that's a, that's much easier said than done in shifting over. Because if you say things to your team like, oh yeah, this ERP implementation is going to be a beat down and it's going to suck and it's probably not going to work right. And the last time we did this, it failed miserably and the IT team doesn't know what they're talking about. And I could list a whole bunch of other things that could possibly be said. Guess how your team is going to respond to that? You know, they're going to respond with a lot of negativity. So all of a sudden you you find yourself in this position where you have to now be an agent of positive communication. And that's not so easy. And especially for somebody who is, you know, first time enrolled, that's going to be really difficult for them to, to make that transition in most cases. Right, right. Um, it's a, it's really a pull, right? Because your friends are going to want you to kind of come to the water cooler and, and, you know, vent with us, right? you know, but you are, like you said, it's, you're in a delicate situation because you also represent the company. Right. So um, advocating the change and being there. And, and so sometimes being a supervisor can be a lonely place, you know, yeah. as, as you move up. So the peer support is super important. Yeah. Um, and, and for our role, uh, we try to come up with key messaging for frontline supervisors to be able to, you know, hear some of the key things to talk through in your team huddles. Uh, so, so scripting is also helpful because you're right. It's hard to, it's hard to know what to say um, yeah. all the time. Yeah. Well, I think there's an opportunity there for, for folks who are seeing this situation play out in their organizations to really pay close attention to the leadership development opportunities for yes. those supervisors, because if we can all agree that the supervisors of the men and women on the front lines play a critical role in the success, then we owe it to them to make sure that they're developed sufficiently and that we're investing in them to become partners with us in, in this communication to the front line. Otherwise, we're just we're setting ourselves and, and everybody involved up for failure. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about <clears throat> some of the tools when we think about, you mentioned early in the beginning of the conversation, one of the difficulties with uh, that, that that men and women on the front line experience today, and, and part of that is communication, and they um, aren't don't necessarily have access to the same communication tools that other members of the workforce may have. Have you found any tools or processes or, or ways to think about closing that gap with the men and women on the front lines? Mm. Um. What we found that has been helpful as we've been going toward implementation is uh, getting these particular advocates in, in representing representing certain areas um, come along and really start to like uh, be in the forefront of learning and and understanding and then go back to their areas and explain it demonstrate it you know really be the hands on hands on the ground kind of person yeah. to uh, and also be the feedback loop because they can advocate for the questions that come up as they're showing the demo and then uh, people are saying hey but what about this uh, and not expecting them to know all the answers right but to say right. well bring it back bring it back and let's raise those questions because those are good practical questions so having those kinds of feedback loops I think are really helpful um which are in-person kinds, you know, those are the kinds of, is people don't always, and especially frontline, don't always take the time to go to uh, a team's chat and pop in a question, you know, they're, they're busy, they're, their focus is the customer. I, so I'm glad you mentioned that because this has actually come up quite a bit in, uh, in my day job at Skillful, where we've, we've had a lot of conversations about gathering additional feedback 
from the, the frontline team members themselves. And that's always been difficult for our customers to get that feedback. They get feedback from a very small percentage of the most vocal people. We have the most vocal positive. We kind of have the most vocal on the negative side, but it's still a very small subset of the population. And we've had a handful of debates internally about this to say, well, how do we get greater engagement with that? And and the, the difficulty is in, in kind of built into the question, right? How do you get the disengaged to engage better? And I, I'm curious if, I mean, well, part of what you're talking about is an amazing suggestion, which is being feet on the street, getting out in front of these folks and having conversations with them. My, I guess, you know, I don't want to say skepticism, but my hesitation in that is how well does that scale across, you know, a, a large organization with many dozens or hundreds of sites and hundreds or thousands of people? Are there ways that maybe we're not thinking of that would allow us to collect that kind of feedback at greater scale? Or is the only answer to that is to just get out and spend, you know, more face time with those folks? Yeah, so you, you, you hit an interesting um, pain point, right, which is the disengaged, because you got the very positive and you got the very negative, yeah. and you will hear feedback on both ends. But what about that miss the, the middle disengaged piece? Um, how do you get them more engaged? And I don't think it's more surveys or more, you know, uh, questions at them. That's just peppering them with more junk. Right. I think it's, it has to be somehow that human touch. And how do we scale that? That's, I think, always been that gap, you know. Um, so if you can within, you know, if you're global, you it's like the typical corporate, right? You break it down by region, by division, right. by department, by team. So if you can get it to that flowing down um, cascade, then it works. But, you know, sometimes it gets stuck based on people's own, you know, availability or right. ability to do it or desire to do it, right? It can get stuck at any point in the leadership cascade. So some pockets may be very willing, but it their leader didn't push it down. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the very nature of frontline work contributes to why this problem is exacerbated with, with these work groups, right? It's part of it is just that they don't always work, you know, a standard shift of eight to five. They don't yes. always work in the same place. Most of the teams that I see in the frontline workforce generally may not even be in the same room at the same time at all throughout yes. a given week. But, you know, to, to connect some dots with some things that we've talked about today, I wonder if there's an opportunity to arm those supervisors with better skills around collecting feedback specifically, right? To right. arm them right. to be the feedback collectors in the organization and, and perhaps use them as our mechanism to explain to them the importance of gathering feedback from their team, explain to them the types of feedback that we're looking for. And if we can turn them into, you know, our army of feedback gatherers, um, you know, to really give them purpose as part of the bigger change initiatives, you know, it's, it's going to hopefully, uh, replace the fact from people from corporate just can't go to 157 sites, but those supervisors are already at those sites. I wonder if there's a way for us to engage them better and, and really kind of turn yes. that into part of the mechanism. Yes, no, that's a very, and when you mentioned the 24 seven, um, you know, I worked in healthcare, right? So hospitals yeah. are like that. Um, yeah. It's exactly when you've got shifts, you know, how do you continue to get feedback from all, all the areas? Um, it reminds me of this one um, situation that we were working on, and it was um, a process improvement situation uh, where they were really trying to reconfigure the exam room and they wanted feedback on it, you know. So what they did was try to make the feedback very easy to collect so that people didn't have to go to a desk, a workstation and a desktop and submit, you know, fill out a form and submit it. They basically just put a clipboard right outside the door. So anytime you were going into the exam room, something was funky, you didn't like it, you just write it on the clipboard. 
like they normally might do for uh, a exam, right? So, yeah. so they, it was very easy for them to provide that feedback as they were going in and out of that pilot, you know, situation. Um, and the different shifts, people would just be writing and they'd see stuff and they'd add to it, you know, hey, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so a very low barrier to entry. Exactly. There's virtually no technical complexity of this. I don't have to figure anything out. It's just, it's a format that I'm very familiar with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the supervisors just encourage them to keep putting the feedback on there, you know, um, all shifts. And at the end of this certain period, we're going to collect it. Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. Any insights that you recall coming from that experience? Any maybe kind of aha moments where you collected some feedback that you said, man, it's a good thing that we had those clipboards up because had we not had that, we would yeah. never have learned this one thing. What's that one thing that came up? That's that's a, yeah, a good question because there was an aha uh -huh that was very interesting. Um, it, you know, in terms of lean processing, right? It, it's like least amount of, of effort go make the flow very, um, very efficient. And so they always set up the room in a certain way. And people were saying, well, you know, now that I understand, we've always gone to um, how we have the refrigerator over here for, um, you know, vaccinations and things that are uh, medications that need to be refrigerated, right? right. So we have it here. But the tables are here, and then I got to go back over here. So I'm crisscrossing back and forth. And until you mentioned it, it always just was part of the process, right? But now we need to put the refrigerator. <laughs> we need to be it have it be all in a line so that I'm just gathering my materials as I go, and then I've got it all, and I hit the patient here at the end, and we're all good. Uh, so they were part of that aha uh -huh moment to say you know we we laid out the room in a certain way just because of convenience or aesthetics but it's not really efficient process in terms of how we help the patient yeah I, that's a perfect example and i think situations like that come up in every major technology implementation if mm -hmm. if it's being done correctly we're not just implementing new technology around the old process, we should be looking at ways to make the processes more efficient, whether they be manual processes or even things that are just following through in a, in a digital workflow of sorts. Mm -hmm. And so those examples are, mm -hmm. are great ones where with the implementation of new technology, we're asking teams to rethink how they do everything. And I right. think that's why some of this change can be as difficult as it often is. Right, right. When you have to examine the work that you've been doing for so long and you're good at it, it's very uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that it is very uncomfortable. And especially just I, you know, it comes up a lot on the show is as humans, we're um we're just a little reluctant to change, right? Even if we know something's not optimized, it's what we know and it gives us some comfort. And it I know that doesn't always seem rational. And and I'm the same way as anybody else. But, uh, you know, if, if we step back and, and really give that a chance and can understand that the future state's going to be better, it really brings everybody, you know, together on that. So oh, yeah. we're, we're already coming up on time. This is, uh, it's, it's really, this time has gone really fast today. I, I'm curious to get one last thought from you, especially in your role as you've been in OCM, both inside organizations and, and now working in an organization where you're providing, you know, uh, advisory services to other organizations. One thing that I one thing that I have observed is that sometimes leadership isn't on board proactively with change management investments on the front end. It seems like change management is often uh, sought after when things maybe aren't going so well. And there's this idea of like, hey, we need to come and bring a sprinkle a little bit of that change management stuff onto this uh, broken project. Why do you think that is? And what do you think that we can do? If you had a microphone and could shout out to all the, the executive leaders who are running these projects, what would you want to say to them to reconsider how they think about change management? Right, right. Wow. 
That's that's really good. I know this could be a probably a whole podcast episode in <laughs> yes, and of itself, right? Exactly. Let me let me just drop this bomb on you as a last question. <laughs> you know, um OCM, it's either looked at as very fluffy and soft because it's related to how people respond to change. Mm -hmm. And if they're not responding well, let's bring in OCM. Or at the very last minute, you know, hey, things are going roughly. Let's bring people in. Let's bring in OCM so we can get some communications out. So yeah. sort of the band aid, right? Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that for ideally, I would want to be in there from the very beginning before a project even kicks off so that I, I can work with leaders to really get understanding around the vision, like I mentioned, right? And what are our targets so that we're very clear what our purpose and objective is and that we get people, um, not just the frontline workers, but we get their leaders aligned. I think that's where people get caught a lot of times is that we work side, we work in silo divisions. And, um, and sometimes it's just because the nature of the work that that people um, you know make decisions that work at cross purposes. So they're they're making decisions about the project that um, that actually butt against another area, if that makes sense. Yeah. So so then we come across many reasons why things are not working well, and to come in at the very end is very difficult because then it is a band aid. We're wow. not actually uh, healing anything. Right. Yeah. I, I wonder if there are any methods to kind of making the ROI case for uh, proactive change management. Do, do you find yes. yourself in that conversation of having to kind of justify the investment of both time and, and dollars mm -hmm. to bring in a, a smart team of change management professionals that, that can help us with this and and help to shift it from being just reactive to something on the proactive side? Yes, that's exactly the next piece of the, the follow on to your first question, right? Is how to make that valuable. Um, and if you're working on what are the outcomes of this project and what are the, uh, the objectives we're trying to achieve and you work clearly to identify and communicate those metrics, then you, you've, pretty much done your value, right? Because um, the company will see that we are, whether we're hitting the targets or not, right? And trying to get the frontline workers to say, hey, we if we all work toward um, whatever that behavior is, right? Like, um, like let's say it's, um, you know, I need to sell a certain service, you know, um, and that I need to do it in the in the system, you know, the system prompts me. So right. not to just shut out and, and exit, but I need to do that next step to sell a certain service. And and we start hitting that mark and they start seeing those numbers go up. That's the um that's the expected success behavior, right? So we need to track those metrics of what we're trying to achieve, not just put in the system. That's you know, project managers kind of track to on time on bot on time on budget for the project but we're looking at the people piece right? right and what are you trying to get out of this whole initiative why are you asking people to to buy into this in the beginning anyway yeah right? well and and you spoke about the outcomes i mean at at the end of the day technology investments are being made to alter outcomes in the future and millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars are being spent on those technology investments. And if we leave out the concept of change management and just let it be an afterthought, then not only are we risking all of the money that we're spending on the tech innovation itself, but far more importantly than that, we're putting at risk the outcomes that we sought to achieve with these investments. And mm -hmm. you know, in, in many of these cases, even significant especially some of the significant digital transformation initiatives, there were pretty big outcomes expected on the back end of this. And so yes. we, we do need to back into that. And so I, I love that focus of kind of thinking about where we expect to end, you know, begin with the end in mind and working our way back. And with all of the, the stakeholders in the project to say, 
yes, we can manage this as just an installation of software, or we can really think of this as an end-to-end -end implementation, making sure that we're we're keeping in mind all the human elements of this, you know, from end to end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really exactly. good. Well, I I really appreciate you you coming on the show today. And um I I, I felt like this was going to go very fast and it did. Um, thank you so much for for sharing your wisdom across, uh, you know, a variety of, of very interesting industries. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Same. Thank you so much for having me. This was a great opportunity to uh, talk my head off about OCM, which I love. And, and I appreciate what all that you're doing for the frontline workers. Too. Thank you so much, Justin. Well, thank you. All right. Well, to our audience, we've got to wrap it up there. So thank you again to Corey for joining me on the show today. And thank you to our listeners for your continued engagement with the podcast. As a friendly reminder, this podcast is sponsored by Skillful, the only end-to-end -end systems training platform that's optimized for frontline operations. You can learn more about how you can solve your frontline systems training challenges by visiting skillful.com. That's S-K-Y-L-L-F-U-L. Dot com. So yes, there's a Y in there for skillful. And uh, thank you all. And we look forward to having you join us on our next episode. Thanks again, Corey.